our team from Harris County to kind of help you guys understand the scope of what happened here with Hurricane Harvey and how it impacted us. I am very excited to introduce Jeff Linder. If any of you watch the footage, he was on nonstop. I don't think he had any sleep for maybe even a week. But he literally has had national and international coverage because he really was the calm voice in the storm. A trillion gallons of water fell on Harris County. That would cover Harris County's 1,800 square miles and 33 inches of water. Helping people understand just what we were going through, what was coming, and dealing with just, you know, incredible amount of information coming out of the request. So we're going to talk about Hurricane Harvey, and I, I want to spend some time, uh, probably most beneficial for y'all toward the end, on uh, lessons learned. Uh, when you face this day, hopefully no time soon, uh, what uh, what you can do for your organization, kind of how we handle things uh, with ours. So uh, this is Harvey. Uh, the end of August, we actually had a tropical storm in uh, the end of June, uh, tropical storm Cindy that made landfall uh, right around Sabine Pass. We were on the dry side of that storm, and we didn't have really any significant impacts from that. We had actually done a hurricane statewide hurricane drill. Uh, in May, and so that was very beneficial to what eventually what we would go through here with Harvey. Anyhow, Harvey developed initially here, fell apart, and then redeveloped in the Gulf of Mexico, went from a tropical depression to a Category 4 hurricane in 48 hours, and made landfall down here on the middle Texas coast, uh, just north of Corpus Christi, about uh, 30 or 40 miles or so north of Corpus Christi as a Category 4 hurricane. There's a Florida State uh, wind tower that was installed at Rockport uh, just before landfall. And that wind instrument recorded 151 miles an hour. And that's 10 miles per hour less than the highest wind ever recorded in the state of Texas. And that was 161 back in 1971 with Hurricane Celia. Interestingly enough, it was almost in the exact same location. Um, the storm moved inland, oh, about 50 miles or so, stopped, stalled, turned around, moved back out to the Gulf of Mexico, made another landfall in Louisiana, and then moved up into the Midwest. And if we did not have all of these significant flooding uh, up here at the upper Texas coast, the real story would be down at Rockport and Port Aransas, uh, where nearly 80% of the structures down in that area were completely destroyed. And a lot of that was the wind and the storm surge that they had. So this was the forecast on Saturday morning. Um, again, Harvey made landfall Friday evening. This is Saturday morning. Uh, the forecasts for Harvey were pretty good. They're about as good as the forecasts you're going to get when you're forecasting three or four feet of rainfall. And everything you see here in purple is over 30 inches up to about uh, three feet. Uh, Houston, where we're at right now, we're about right here. Um, and one of the lessons we learned from this was that people understood we were going to have flooding, people understood we were going to have impacts, people understood it was going to rain a lot, but really none of us, including the meteorologists, none of us could comprehend what three, four, in some cases five feet of rain was going to do, and how widespread the rain was going to be. Um, I certainly thought we were going to see 40 inches of rain, but past experience has taught me that we see that in an, in an area. So in a portion of a county or over a city. Never have we seen it over the widespread and spatial coverage we saw with Harvey. So this is landfall on Friday evening. Again, at Rockport and Port Aransas, uh, the, the hurricane was intensifying on land, through landfall. Uh, the pressure continued to fall. You can already see Friday evening, we do have rain breaking down well to the north and east of the center. So this is up in the Houston Galveston area and even over to southern Louisiana. So this is going into saturating the ground. So we're loading the water to the ground so that when the big rains would come on Saturday night, there would be pretty much maximum runoff potential. And up until Saturday evening, we were relatively fine here in Harris County. This was the center of the storm. 
Uh, still, this is inland now for about 24 hours. We still have a 65 mile per hour tropical storm uh, northwest of Victoria right here is a visitor center. And up until about 9 o'clock, we were doing pretty good in Harris County. We had rain. It had, we had enough breaks that the water was running off between the rain. Um, we had some tornadoes on Saturday, but everything was relatively okay until 9 o'clock, 8, 9 o'clock. And things went downhill very, very quickly. And most of the times when we have floods in Harris County, that is how it happens. You're perfectly fine, and three hours later, you're flooding. Uh, Memorial Day 15 is another prime example of that. Uh, we were perfectly fine all day long. It started raining very heavily about 8 o'clock, and by midnight, you had horrible flooding going on. And Harvey was really no exception. Uh, everything you see here in red, is hourly rainfall rates of four to six inches. In some places, that's what they get in an entire year. We were getting that in uh, For the most part, our underground drainage systems can handle about two inches per hour. Our street gutter systems. Once we exceed that, the water is, the streets are designed to fill up and flood to hold water, to hopefully keep it out of homes. Unfortunately, in a lot of circumstances, when you're getting six, five, six, and close to seven inches of rain an hour, there's just not enough capacity to hold that amount of water. As the night went on, this is that initial band that I showed you that formed on the west side of the county. It had moved um, across the county during the night. So this is just uh, about 5 a.m. Sunday morning. So painstakingly slow movement, uh, very heavy rainfall. On top of that, additional bands developed behind that. So we kept dumping water on top of water. And the realization was about two o'clock in the morning, in some areas, especially south and east of downtown, that we were getting water very deep at home. And we're talking chest, neck deep. And that was coming in through 911 calls and also into our phone bank that we had established, uh, both at the emergency operations center and also at our office. And so I worked with, we worked with our first responder agencies, the fire marshal's office, uh, what the messaging we wanted. Uh, one thing we do very good here in Southeast Texas, Harris County, is uh, we work very closely with our National Weather Service office and with our TV media. And it's something called an IWT, an Integrated Warning Team. Uh, it's put on by the National Weather Service. We meet twice a year. We get everybody in the same room. Emergency managers, TV meteorologists, River Authorities, Flood Control Districts, uh, and the National Weather Service. Because what we learned during Hurricane Rita back in 2005 is that if we are not all saying the same thing, people are hearing different things. And they're making different decisions on different pieces of information coming from different sources. We all have to say the same thing at the same time. Especially when we want the public to respond to what we're asking them to do. And so a lot of our coordination happens in this NWS chat. We're all in there and we're all grounded in there in the same common messages. We're passing information back and forth. And so when I come out and say, I need the National Weather Service and the media to get this information out, a lot of times this is how we disseminate uh, critical, in some cases, life-saving information. Um, so what we wanted them to do, we wanted residents to get to the roof. We did not want them going into their attics. We learned from Hurricane Katrina if people go into their attics, first responders cannot find you. They cannot see you from a helicopter or a boat if you're in your attic. <laughs> also, if the water keeps rising, there's no way out unless you took something up there to cut your way, to cut yourself out. Uh, we had a tremendous call volume into our 911 centers. At one point, there was about 8,900 calls in queue on 911 back, backlog for people needing rescue. So we were urging people not to hang up. We we're also urging people, do not call 911 just because you have water in your house. A lot of people have water in their house. If it's a life-threatening emergency, call 911. So by 10 o'clock the next morning, this is what it looked like. We had widespread flooding. Initially, the flooding, the very deep flooding, was concentrated in this portion of the county and then had, had become almost countywide by mid-morning, and not only countywide, but regionwide. Our counties to the southwest, Fort Bend and Waller, were facing similar conditions to the north, Montgomery, down in Galveston to the south, same thing. The city of Dickinson, 
which is about right here, 80% of that town was underwater. 80%. Uh, these are some of the rainfalls. Uh, almost 15 inches in three hours over the city of South Houston. So much water fell out of the sky that literally there was just nowhere for it to go and it just developed. It just rose right where it fell. It fell so fast. Uh, we had almost seven inches in an hour. Just short, or just over two feet in the 24 hour period. And it just kept going. Almost four feet of rain in one location in the 40 period. The previous worst storm in American history for that same 2,000 square miles, five day period, was in the state of Louisiana in August of 1940. And it produced 29.8 inches of rain. So Harvey exceeded the previous worst storm in American history by almost 14 inches. And when you're dealing with water, look at the previous record. This is a hundredth of an inch. So if you take the worst storm you can imagine, Harvey exceeded it by 14 inches, which is absolutely unbelievable. obviously canceled our flights and didn't go to New York. But while you were there, knowing what was happening to us, many generous people took up donations to try and, and help us out. On top of that, a number of you um, gathered money in your, in your departments. Y'all were texting, you were calling, you were letting me know, what can I do? Those donations, you know, giving that money to my um, employees, and I'll talk about that in a minute, that were devastated. Every single person cried. It made a big, big difference. So from the bottom of my heart, I just want to thank you. Um, it's an honor to be part of this kind of community. So prepare for the storm. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because a lot of this is things that you already know. You know, we knew there might be power outages. Um, there had been Memorial Day floods. There, had, there were tax day floods. Uh, our plans had held. Things had worked. Uh, the precautions we had taken during that time period always worked. So I spent quite a bit of time. This was my first hurricane. And we had a few close, you know, we had some pictures like this earlier in the year and I'd walk into Dr. Lovin's office and say, what do you think? Are, are we going to get hit? And he goes, all I see is a big blue or red blob. <laughs> Not with Harvey. So Harvey's coming. Um, I talked to my staff who had been through prior hurricanes and talked about our different facilities and, and plants. It had always worked. Never perfect but had helped. This time was different. So, like I said, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this, but those are just some real basic things. One of the really challenging things for me, I had two residential treatment facilities in two different locations. Um, you know, we made sure we had our prescriptions, our food, our water, our, uh, extra supplies. I mean, we talked about everything we could possibly think of, and yes, some of this had been written up already. Uh, trust me, that's gonna be a much bigger plan as we're going forward, and you'll see why. 
So, what happened <laughs> when Harvey hit? Um, as Jeff said, Saturday night, the rain really started. I went to bed that night in my condo. Everything was fine. I thought, we're going to be okay. You know, I didn't go to bed till maybe 2 a.m. 6 o'clock in the morning, maybe a little bit before, I have a neighbor banging on my door and says, hey, we're getting flooded. So this is what I woke up to in my condos. My car was underwater, which was nothing. And, it, and let me be clear, nothing compared to what people were going through. We, were, we had a lot of elderly people in the condos I live in. So we were concerned because the water, I, I live right behind Buffalo, or right by Buffalo Bayou, which I thought was a great idea when I moved to Houston. <laughs> um, we had water, the biggest concern we had is the water was coming up off the bayou so fast we thought it was going to take out the transformer. And there were a lot of concerns about, like I said, our elderly folks. So there was a lot going on there. Well, shortly after that, I get a phone call from the county engineer. If you get a phone call from the county engineer that's overall Harris County, it's not good. I see his number, 7 a.m., first major crisis. He says, well, actually, I got a text. Call me now, basically, right now. We have massive flooding downtown. He was talking about, actually, the reservoirs. Even at that point, there was concern about the direction things were going. The rainfall had exceeded what they expected. And he said, look, people are reporting they're smelling gas in the facility. So, I had 270 men in a downtown facility. And these tended to be, they were downtown, by the way, next to the jail for a reason. So, very challenging. I had staff there. So they were, started calling as well. Staff did. We're smelling gas, Dr. May. Uh, we have a flood door. You know, there's a sub level of the facility. We have a flood door, we always clear the equipment, it's always held. There might have been a little bit of a breach, but it's never been past that since I've been here. And per reports from prior employees uh, and current employees, not even in past hurricanes. So I talked to the engineer and he said, look, Center Park Point's already been out there. They can't find the loop. My phone every two seconds, text, phone calls, text, phone calls. Dr. May, we're smelling gas. It's getting stronger, it's getting stronger. We're very, we're very afraid. I talked to the county engineer, I'm like, what can I do? Can I get them out? The jail's next door. Can we go over there? He goes, there's gas leaks in the jail. Two. We managed over time to, to get five buses scheduled. That's what it was gonna take. The, gen the, the men that were in the facility could not take anything with them. There was no room, no mattresses, no clothes, none of their belongings. There was just no room. It was minimal what they could take. We couldn't take all the extra supplies we would bought. There was just no room. So the next thing is, I'm talking with the folks that are working with me on the buses and they're like, look, we gotta figure out how to get the guys from downtown, and this is quite a stretch, out to your Atascacita facility, which is an Humble, in sort of the northern part of the county. So that took another source of phone calls. They're like, they're telling me, you know, we're probably gonna need a, a escort uh, because there's most, a lot of the roads are already getting closed down. There's very few paths, we're trying to figure it out. So, what happened? We got the guys loaded on five buses. They met at a rendezvous viewpoint with the state troopers, Department of Public Safety. Drove the wrong way on an HOV lane to get out to Atascacita. And they had to take a couple of other really, really tough excursions. So crisis over? Oh no. It gets better. I got them out of downtown. And these are hours 
as Jeff saying a phone calls, things going on. So next thing, I get them out. Now I have them at a facility that isn't designed for 500 guys to be on one side, which is what I was about to do. I just introduced, I just doubled the population in that facility. I had a gym and I had a rec hall, or basically a cafeteria or building for that. That's where they slept. First night they slept on cardboard boxes. In the clothes they had on, so we're scrounging for clothes. I don't have showers in those buildings. I didn't, you know, there's one bathroom. They weren't dorms. They weren't made for this. They didn't have, you know, all, their, all of their needs. The other thing I find out, and we had, we had food supplies that were gonna last if we couldn't cook and couldn't get things in for a few days. My vendor that provides food for me and the county jail, their entire operation went completely underwater. And they're like, Dr. May, you know, within a couple of days, we're not going to be able to help you. And you think about it, if you're running 24-7, you have at least three shifts you got to cover. And we have a lot of people in treatment. Emotionally is by far the most challenging thing I've ever been through. It needs to be way bigger than it probably is. You got to have communication through multiple mediums. I can tell you right now, we have now have a Facebook page. Uh, we have a communications person to help us for lots of reasons. We're, we have a Twitter. I didn't have any of that before. Uh, and we're looking at a whole host of other ways to make sure we get information out. You gotta know your local leaders. I think that's been very clear. That was a lifesaver. You're gonna have to be patient. I didn't sleep, the phone rang nonstop. And by the way, you know, while the phone's ringing, you know, my families, everybody I've known in my life, because I'm using my personal cell phone. I didn't have a work cell phone with me, and I had, I'm going to have to get one. Texting, it, it just didn't, it was constant. I couldn't tell them I was okay, because I, had, I could not miss a phone call. You need to know how the command center and the structure works inside and out. There's quite a process. Uh, I knew a little bit about it. I'd been on phone calls and prepare, preparation, you know, had some ideas. I had no idea the detail. And it's a whole different language in making requests than we're used to. They talk assets. You know, I'm talking to U.S. Marshals who are using language that I could never get. It's police language or martial language. You know, they'd say things like coffee. Oh, I thought that was only on TV. <laughs> and text, back to me. So, you gotta know how that does. Your HR department, you gotta have some contingencies for disaster. You've got people, the last thing they can afford to lose is their paycheck. The schools were closed down for two weeks. You can't travel on the roads. You can't get anywhere. And there are folks that have their lives completely torn apart. How do you help them? How do you make sure you can do that? You gotta figure that out. We had to work with our lawyer to put some things in on that. Even though you hear on the news, you know, JJ Watt raised a lot of money. There were donations coming in. They're still setting up structures to get that to people. Some of it's already getting built out, but it's not fast and it's not easy. And FEMA doesn't cover a lot of things. They don't cover rent. I mean, you, you got to learn that piece as well. <sighs> Recovery, it's going to take a while. It's going to take a while. Good news is, people like you, I did not talk to anyone, run to anyone that didn't want to help. I had people that I hadn't talked to in years. 
Dr. May, what can we do?